if I remember correctly, you had left a different company and you went with a new company that uh, you were, you were going to partner up with somebody on. And I was wondering how things are going uh, with that new endeavor. Yeah, that's, that's actually been phenomenal. I think that uh, that seven year tenure uh, with that other development company in Dallas uh, was good. Uh, it was good for some learning and it was really just kind of placing some different relationships uh, where they needed to be. But this next move was really huge for me because it was a, it was a two part move. It was, I took the president's chair of the commercial roofing division at Priority uh, Roofing out of Dallas, which also has a Denver location, an Austin location, and we're, off, we're opening up some more. And I think we have about 70, 80 sales guys right now, so a much larger ship uh, moving at a much higher pace. And then I also partnered up in the fluid applied industry uh, with a national company that has been doing it for 51 years. They're on their third generation now. So the uh, the grandfather started it, and there's the father, and then the son, who's about the same age as me, have been working hand in hand, and we've been getting it done. So it was a really big move, a really exciting move, and the thing that I liked about it is it put me more in uh, the power seat when it comes to a national level, even when it comes to the multifamily. I have a lot of guys like yourself that'll contact me, and, you know, we can mobilize and get things done much quicker, quicker, more efficient, and some really aggressive price points, especially some of the uh, manufacturer relationships that have been established for decades now. Uh, with the guys that I'm working with. So you, you can get multifamily projects done across the nation, uh, no matter really where they are then. Mm -hmm. Absolutely. That's nice. Okay. That's, That's great. We're actually That's getting great. ready to mobilize in Arizona here pretty soon. Nice. I we're like it. 41 buildings out in uh, uh, Phoenix, Arizona, we're going to get over to, but it's going to be hot. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. How about yourself? Uh, what's been going on lately and how's this uh, COVID affected you? I know that you guys had a, always have a lot of stuff going on. Uh, with M MPG, how's that affected it? Well, yeah, you know, um, it's it's really been um, kind of a a tale of of two stories. Um, I think when when coronavirus COVID nineteen hit, I think all of us multifamily owners slash operators were really expecting uh, the uh, the worst with all the job losses. We really thought that rents were going to fall off a cliff. And so, um, you know, at the end of March, as we sort of went into shelter in place, we really battened down the hatches uh, with our respective companies, myself included. And we really uh, did everything we could to really get as lean as we could. And we really focused on conserving cash. And we, we scrapped a lot of our capital, um, capital expense uh, projects that we were going to do just because we thought that we might see as much as a 10, 30 to 30 percent drop in, in revenue uh, rents collected. Uh, with with people losing jobs, and so kind of fast forward to uh, where we're at today, which is you know right around I think June June uh, June sixth. It's really like I said, tale of two 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 stories. Um, you know the, the story uh, leading up to the to the shelter in place was going to be that the rents were going to fall off a cliff. Uh, what we've seen uh, is that it's been really uh, almost as close to normal as you could have expected. In fact, if if um, if you didn't really tell me the coronavirus was going on and I just looked at my, my profit and loss statements uh, over the last, uh, you know, two months and, uh, and, and some odd days, I really couldn't tell you that there was much difference. Um, so I think overall it's been great uh, so far, but I think there's a big concern because there's been a lot of stimulus uh, money that's been given by the federal government out. As you know, there was, you know, the federal government gave out stimulus checks to every single person that was under a certain amount of, um, of income per year. And so that's really helped our residents to, uh, to pay their bills because we specialize in workforce housing, which is, you know, your, uh, B and C class, uh, multifamily, uh, 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 class buildings. So, you know, we're really working with blue collar people that are, you know, they're, they're making their living, um, in blue collar workforce type of jobs, which, you know, they've seen the most impact, uh, from the job losses that have happened. So I think, you know, with stimulus checks and also with unemployment, that was a big deal. Um, there's been enhanced unemployment benefits that have been given out by the government uh, in an effort to sort of keep uh, people's heads above the water. And we certainly believe strongly that, that all that uh, goodness from, uh, I guess, goodness, depending on where you look at it, uh, has helped our, uh, our residents to make their rents. Uh, moving forward into Q3, as we sort of look forward past June, which I think June will be just fine. It's going to be interesting uh, to see what happens when uh, the stimulus and the unemployment benefits start to taper off. And then people are going to either have to get back to work or, you know, there's definitely going to be some point in time where we reach sort of a, 
a threshold where you know people run through their savings and then we may see some sort of a dip uh, in the ability of our renters to make rent payments. But so far, so good. Yeah, that's a good report. I know as a contractor who works with multifamily investors, I was wondering with those B and C class properties, you know, are rents going to get paid? Uh, that was one of the things I was wondering because without rents getting paid, you obviously going to want your reserves and you're wondering, okay, when is CapEx going to be coming back around? Now, with that being said, I guess a couple questions. Uh, I know we can't tell exactly what's going to happen in the future, but when are you thinking maybe CapEx products will come back around? And then also from the flip side of the coin, is this a good time as an investor to be looking for other types of deals in your opinion, or is it a time to just kind of sit tight and see if this thing blows over? I mean, two, two great questions. Uh, why don't we start with the first one, sort of what do we think is, is going to happen here going forward? Um, you know, I, I, really, I really believe that we're going to have to wait until we start to see people going back to work and start to see the economy open up before we can say for sure what's going to happen. Um, a, a big, big news that just came out as, as of today was that the, the jobs report that came out actually said uh, that the number of jobs uh, in, in the, U the U.S. actually, unemployment actually got better, meaning more people went back to work. We were expecting uh, millions of people more to actually uh, uh, indicate that they had lost their jobs. We had the, not only did we have it be less than that, but we actually had it be positive, meaning people actually went back to work, which was shocking. Uh, and I think that that's actually an indication that maybe things are just a little bit better than maybe we thought they were. And that's still bad. I mean, it's still the amount of jobs we've lost as a country is staggering. And there's really no comparison in history, uh, even going back to the Great Depression of the 30s. But um, I think that if we can, can continue to see some sort of a trend of states opening back up for business and people going back to work, um, and that reflecting in some of the, um, the GDP numbers uh, nationwide, I think that's when you're going to see people feel um, a heck of a lot better. And until then, there's just a little bit of uncertainty. Yeah. Makes sense. Yeah. yeah and I think new investments, what's your thoughts? Well, you know, I think new investments, you know, the, the big challenge right now uh, is that there is a, um, there's a mismatch between uh, what sellers uh, want to sell their properties for and what buyers want to buy their properties for. And what I mean by that is if you, if you think about, you know, maybe like January, February, uh, the economy was humming along and multifamily was trading at all time highs um, and continuing to trade at all time highs. People were just buying deals left and right. Um, it was very hard to be a buyer. Um, and then sort of the COVID-19 happened and things just kind of came to a grinding halt. Deals just fell off the table. Nobody was transacting. And, um, and now that we sort of go into sort of this, this last three months where we've actually seen good rent collections, the sellers are going, well, you know, I haven't seen anything wrong with my P&L. I'm not showing any sort of um, negative impacts from this COVID-19 with, with, with my property. And so if I do want to sell it right now, I'm not going to be willing to give a discount on the pricing because to me, it's worth the same because I haven't seen a dip. Um, and then this, and then the buyers are going, yeah, but you know, if I'm going to try to buy your property, the outlook for the next six to 12 months is very uncertain. Most likely there's not going to be any rent growth happening with this thing. Um, and so I don't think I'm willing to really pay you what I would have been willing to pay you before, uh, the coronavirus impact. So, you know, sellers are going, well, you know, in that case, I think I'm just going to sit tight cause I'm not going to, I'm not going to sell if I don't need to, and I can't get the price that I think I deserve. And the buyers are over here going, you know, I just can't afford to pay you what I paid you before because the prospects of your property are not looking as great. So I think until you sort of have um, sort of some sort of clarity in terms of what's happening with the economy, and then you can have some sort of price expectations that align between buyers and sellers, I think you're going to continue to see um, just sort of a wait and hold period right now for, for, for people buying deals. Yeah, it sounds like a little bit more of a safer play. And it kind of goes back to what you're saying, because as you said, you know, the government's shown up with a lot of resources, stimulus checks, unemployment, but that's not forever. You know, if you look at folks when they get unemployment, you, you get a dollar amount. And when that dollar amount runs out, it, it's, it's done. So, you know, it could be good now, but later on down the road, it starts trickling off. You know, one of the things that will end up not getting paid will be, unfortunately, will be rent. They got to pay food and gas probably before they pay the rent and, and some of those that, properties. So. 
Makes yeah, you got it right. And I mean, in some cases nowadays, there's people that are making more money on unemployment than they were making at their own jobs, which is actually uh, a big, you know, um, reason why they may not really want to go back to work, even if they could. So, I mean, we just don't know uh, really what's going to happen uh, once these things start to dry up. And I think the biggest thing is that states reopening, I think, is, is, a, is a positive. And I think that, that people getting back to work um, is really what's going to drive this thing forward. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I, what I like the most, too, because I know how you guys do it, is always the long game play. I know from talking to you and talking to your team, it's always been, you know, the conservative long game play. And now I look there and I'm like, man, if I was a passive invest, investor, which I've been working on doing with you guys right before this habit, this is a time where I'd be so thankful that it's a long game play and not just a quick, you know, quick play. So I think that I just kind of shows proof of concept in the way that you guys actually do things. Well, yeah, I mean, I think, you know, we've been doing it for what, 13, 14 years now. And uh, we, we've been, um, you know, long term successful. And we've really developed a reputation with our investors as being um, a little bit more conservative and slow and steady as she goes and really focused on sort of the long term. So I think we d definitely want to sort of um, keep that going. Um, and I think that's something that our investors appreciate about our company. Yeah, absolutely. So one thing I definitely wanted to chat with you about uh, outside of the pandemic and the COVID-19 is I, I've got you on here. You've got great experience as an investor in the multifamily game. And I know there's going to be a lot of contractors watching this. Contractors like myself want to build relationships that will sustain with multifamily investors. So I kind of want to dial in on that a little bit. What would you say are the do's and don'ts for contractors when trying to build a relationship with individuals like yourself? Gosh, you know, it's such a great question. Um, I think that the best relationships that we've had with our contractors have been the guys that, um, that really keep it simple. And they really look to, um, you know, when we need something, they look to be there um, quickly. And they, they do what they say and they say what they do. Um, one of the things that I really have enjoyed in working with, with you personally, um, and I'm not just saying this cause I'm on your show is you guys were on the ball when we needed a quote and when we needed you to be there to walk the deal and show us what you could do. But more importantly, once we, uh, you know, and your pricing was, was, uh, was competitive, right? I mean, we, we, we didn't, ex we weren't looking for the low cost leader. That's not just who we are. We want to work with people that want to do the they give us the best value, meaning that for the dollar we spend, we get the most return. That's, and usually working with the low cost leader is usually not that, it's not a good experience, right? So what we really liked about, about working with you guys, for example, was um, you guys showed up, you were hungry, you got everything done, you gave us the bid, it was re really straight and simple. But more importantly, once we decided to give you the project, I was just blown away by two things. Number one was how you guys, uh, started when you said you were going to start and you were ready to go. And then number two is the way that you kept us updated um, along, along the, uh, as the progress was happening from building to building as you were, you know, you started with building one, you ripped off the roofs, you sent us pictures, you had an automated system with a, with a software program that gave us updates, pictures, everything. We knew what was happening. Um, and then, you know, same thing, building two happened, same concept. So I would say that the amount of communication and the follow through with what you said you were going to do to me was, was really what blew us away. And, um, for, for owners like us, what's really important is when we're going to do a rehab, uh, you know, multimillion dollar rehab to one of these big properties that we have, it's all about, um, getting the fastest, uh, um, experience to our residents. So meaning if, if we go in there and, and we, and, and we ha we're working with contractors that say that they're going to get something done in, in, in 60 days and then they take six months. It, not only is it, is it bad for us, but it makes our residents feel like we're just not doing our job. Yeah. And it, it really takes away from the impact of what we want to do, which is transform that community for the residents, right? I mean, what we're doing is for them. Th those are our customers. So I just want to encourage every vendor out there that when you're looking to work with an owner, it's just really about doing uh, what you say you're going to do. And most importantly, executing um, and keeping us informed of what's going on. That, that's what it's all about. Yeah. Well, I appreciate the positive feedback. You know, we try to work really hard. One of the things that I stand on is that raving fan culture with your clients. You know, we try to get it to where, you know, 
it's not just basic or you you did a good job, but it's a raving fan. So it's like the next time that she says how to inspect something, you know that the price is going to be good. You know what you're working with and you don't want to work with anybody else. You want to continue just to work with us and just make sure everything goes smoothly. Now, with what's going on right now, what we've already kind of talked about, because I know a lot of contractors are like, okay, well, how do I engage in these relationships or start these relationships or where's their opportunity in this time to build those relationships? Obviously, you've already made it clear, you know, there's not going to be a lot of CapEx stuff going out right now. But just some of my thoughts and, and, and tell me what you think is now's a perfect time to be planning. I'm always in meetings planning for third quarter, fourth quarter, 2021, and looking to build those relationships. So right now I'm at the building stage with some of the other multifamily investors. What are some things in your opinion that contractors can do, not looking for any type of immediate work, but in building relationships with multifamily investors during this time? Well, you know, one of the, one of the biggest things that's a big challenge for owners right now is, um, you know, I'll take, for example, roofs, because we're, we're talking about, you know, roofing company. A lot of times what we're, what we're looking to do, if we need to replace a roof is, you know, we're going to have to replace, uh, that's going to be an expenditure of, you know, uh, hundreds of thousands of dollars. And, um, it's got to be the right time for us to be able to execute. But in the meantime, if we're at that point where we're considering to replace a roof, for example, we're going to have an existing roof that's going to be in terrible shape. Um, so we're going to have, you know, when it rains, for example, we're going to have roof leaks all over the, the whole property and, um, and we're going to have to turn to somebody to kind of help us get through that until we can sort of go and turn that CapEx, uh, you know, uh, lever back on so we can replace the roof. So one of the things that I think is really great is if a contractor that's looking to do business with somebody is willing to sort of do the small fix, s small minor repairs for whatever it is that we want to replace. I think that speaks volumes uh, because it's hard, it's really hard to get a qualified person to go fix roof leaks in the first place. And so if there's a company that's looking to do a huge job with me and they're willing to come out maybe one or two times and fix some of the smaller stuff, which isn't a huge job for them, but they're willing to do that, that pretty much obligates me um, to use them for the major project on the back end. On the flip side, if I've got a big contractor that, you know, let's say, for example, the COVID-19 happened and I can't spend the money right now to do the, the project that I want to do, but I want to do these minor repairs because I got to keep my residents happy. And if this guy, I can't get a hold of him or he says, you know what, I'm too busy because I got a bunch of other stuff going on. I really can't help you right now, JC. I think that when I come around to having the money to execute on that project, I think that, you know, it's it's easier for me to go, hey, you know what? This guy wasn't there for me when I really needed him. And so now that I've got this big carrot at the end of the stick, yeah, he wants to do it, but it's it, there's no loyalty at that point. I may still use him, but I may not because the loyalty of him taking care of me when I needed him, it, it's not there. So if you want to ask me what's the biggest thing you can do is in times of need, uh, you've got to be there for the guy, even if they can't give you the big job right then and there. That, that's what it comes down to, to me. And that's really shows a, a person places a value on a long-term relationship versus just kind of a one and done. Let me see what I can get with this job. And then I'm off and you don't hear from me again. Yeah. I love that because it just kind of piggybacks on stuff that I say at conferences and classes all the time. So I, and especially right now, I've been telling people, you know, when we get pressed like this during this pandemic, it, it, it gives you an opportunity to see what comes out of you and who you are. And there's been a lot of guys that I have stuff lined up and they had some leaks come in and I tell guys all the time, I'm like, you want to generate relationships, do commercial repairs. There's so many companies out there that want nothing to do with putting a few shingles on or fixing TPO or just coding something because there's no dollars in it. There's no real revenue in, in their opinion for it. I believe repairs can be used as marketing dollars. I can't tell you how many times I'll go out and I'll repair it. And I'm like, don't worry about it. Cause it doesn't cost us too much to do it. And then those guys always come back. Hey, can you give me a bid for this? We're we'll redoing this project now. And it's worked so good. And that's one of the things I teach in some of the master classes. repairs are marketing dollars, or you can take them very seriously, have very aggressive numbers on them and service all of them. And it can be a very lucrative part of your business as well. So it has a lot of advantages to it. So I, I like that you said that from the other side and it's not a biased, you know, opinion like mine when I'm teaching a class and it actually just kind of falls in line with some of the stuff that I tell these guys. It's, it's the God's honest truth. I mean, it's such a great, and I know you guys do that. And I know you guys have done that for us. And I can tell you for sure that when, when we talk internally about who's going to do our roof, 
there's no question, right? I mean, you guys have been there for us when we've needed to do these repairs and, and we don't take that lightly because we know that you're busy doing a lot of big stuff. And we know that when you come to do a small repair like that, we know that, you know, it, it, it means your guys can't do other stuff. So we feel an obligation as, as owners of, of these properties to return, uh, the favor in big spades, uh, you know, on the, on the other side, when we have the big job for you. Yeah. And I always I tell individuals when we're talking about multifamily, obtaining multifamily accounts, I'm like, you have to remember that those tenants, that's what they're there for. They're rehabbing the properties, making it a better place, revitalizing it. And those tenants pay their rents and that's what they purchased the properties for. So we came up with a tagline, you know, it's not the roof, but what's under the roof that counts. And I try to drill that into our guy's head. Like, just remember, it's what under that roof that counts. It doesn't even matter if it's multifamily, commercial, residential. But if you go in there with that mindset, knowing that, it definitely will change your thinking on it and help these guys be more successful in the contracting industry. Well, it's, it's really nice to work with people that think like that, that think like-minded, because I think that speaks to another, what I would say, sticky part about a contractor that's working with us. If a contractor sees the, 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 the world the same way that we do and they, they see the value in the residents being happy because that drives our business. It makes it a lot easier to do business with you because we have an alignment of interest. Um, a lot of times if we have contractors that just want to do a real cheap job and just do the, do the, the quickest and dirtiest thing that they can, they can think of, um, it's really doing a disservice to our residents, which in a way is going to impact my business long term. So that's just something that we don't want to get into uh, that type of a situation. I agree. Well, I know you're busy, so I got one more good question for you. Uh, and one of the things that I admired the most about how you all operate was the long game conservative play. As a roofing contractor, I've been fortunate that it's been very lucrative for me, but you get these dollars and you want to invest them, but I just don't know anything else other than commercial roofing. I live it, breathe it. I'll probably never change what I'm doing. I'm setting it up for my son. So it's like my thing. So when I saw opportunities, a passive investor with a conservative long game company, it was really, I started keying in and that's when I, I looked to you guys and then we came into this, this pandemic, but you guys are already making that play. What would you say is one thing that you guys do on a regular basis that this was very unforeseen, but prepared you to be okay, to be stable and sustainable during this time? I, I think that we've always, uh, res, uh, if you want a specific answer, I'll give you this. It's operating reserves, okay? Every company, and I don't care what kind of business you're in, has to have a safety net, a safety net of, of cash in the bank that's gonna get you through a rainy day. Um, every, every big property, every big, uh, you know, uh, thing that we do, we always carry a, a hefty amount of money in the bank just in case. Mm -hmm. And so, uh, when this whole thing happened, we really didn't worry about it at all because we knew we had enough money in the bank in case there was some sort of a dip that we could make it through. So I think, you know, the very, really simple answer to your question of, you know, what, what can we do to prepare for things that we don't know anything about? It's, it's really is to have, a reserve account, um, a, a, an amount of money in the bank at all times that gets you through the tough times because we still got to make payroll. You know, we still got a mortgage payment. All that stuff doesn't stop, even if the rents get delayed by a month or two. So that's, I think to me is, is one of the things that I would say is really something that you as a, as an investor would, would want to make sure that you understand about a partner that you're going to go with is, you know, do they have operating reserves? What their, what's their strategy there? Um, in case there's, there's a rainy day event and you get, you can get through that without losing your shirt. Yeah, absolutely. Well, I look forward to getting through the rest of this COVID-19 and everything else that's perilous that we have going on right now. And, uh, you and I getting back to, to making things happen and just thank you, JC, for taking time to just to chat with us today. And, uh, we'll talk to you again soon. My pleasure, man. Best of luck with your business. I enjoy seeing all of your marketing materials and, uh, and, uh, and I'm happy to be on your show. I appreciate it. Yeah, thanks, man. The one thing I love too, every time I talk to you, I'm always learning something. That's the one <laughs> thing I love when I'm talking because I'm very interested in multifamily, so I'm always learning something, but it's something other than roof. So I appreciate that. Man. No worries, man. All right. Thanks. Take care.